Um, boys and girls, uh, staff members, colleagues, um, welcome to Winter School. And I just want to say well done. Um, well done for making it out. Well done for making use of this tremendous opportunity. Um, and it's it's going to be valuable for you. I, I certainly believe it. Um, just a shout out to those schools that I've seen have um, logged on so far. Sunridge Circle, Fuhrbrich, John Ramsey, Florida High School, St. Andrews, Robin Vale, Delft Technical. And if there are others that I've missed out, I see Ellswood there. So welcome, guys. And it's it's a tremendous privilege from my perspective to be able to share with you today. Um, I'm going to take you through certainly the comprehension component of paper one. And then we are going to have a look at um, paper three and give you some tips there um, in terms of your preparation for prelims. Um, very kindly, Mrs. Rhoda and uh, Mrs. Raycliffe have informed me that I will also be part of the last push presentation, which will be in October, close towards um, your, you know, preparing your guy, you for finals. And we will cover a number of other things. I now know what I've covered, but we'll cover a number of other things like, for instance, your questions three and four in your uh, language paper, and then delve a little bit deeper into some of the, um, the paper three things. Okay, so um, I'm going to get right started there. Just to give you an idea, um, as Ms. Rhoda said, I'm from Milneton High School. Um, I'm an English teacher there, and I've been an English teacher there for at least 20 years, but I've been teaching English at this level for about 28 years. So um, I'm, I've been in the game for a long time, and I am hope that I can give you some tips that will, will be able to focus your preparation. But what I do want to say is that, um, you know, learners, the grade 12, English home language is never meant to be a simple walk in the park. Um, and I don't want to make it sound more than it is, but um, the perceptions of the examiners when you get there are certainly that you are confident and capable in Present or, or presenting the language and writing the language and in, in, in thinking the language. And so this process doesn't actually ha happen without you actually having to, to work hard and prepare yourself. And I say that because I've been in classes where people think, hey, it's English, it, we speak English all the time, and so it's going to be easy and all we need to pitch up and, and, and write exams. But the reality of that is, is not the case. If you're wanting a good mark in your matric final examinations, then now is the time to, to prepare. There's an old story that said the best time to plant a tree was 15 years ago. Um, if you're wanting to, if you haven't done that, then now is the second best time to plant the tree. So I'm hoping that this is going to be a kick on with regards to now I'm in that last final three months of my grade 12 year. I'm going to give this everything that I've got. Okay, so we're going to start off um, and hopefully in front of you, you should have a copy of the um, common paper that you guys wrote. Um, many of you, I presume, wrote that paper in June, July. I'm going to be referring to that. Even if you don't have your answers there, I'm going to ask you to re-answer a number of those questions, given the tips that, I've uh, that, that I'll that i show you. And then also the language paper from last year, 2023 um, home language final paper three, and hopefully some format notes that um, have been forwarded to you. And then also, as always, something to take notes on. It's very, very important that you're always writing down things. As they come to me, as they come to you, and we've mentioned them, keep a note for them because going forward, that's going to be your reference point. That's something that you can think about um, when you're preparing for your prelims and when you're preparing for your finals. So, first question up. Um, oh, there we go. That's what I've asked you to bring. Okay. Um, and I've covered that. So the first question up, 
that I'd like to um, ask you is what is the most effective first step in preparing for an exam? Is it A, cramming the night before? Is it B, creating a study schedule? Or some people might say schedule. Is it C, pulling an all-nighter? An all-nighter is where we work through the night and we try and get in as much as possible. Or D, if we are looking at the seven subjects that we're preparing or six for final exams, do we ignore the weaker ones and then focus on the stronger ones? Okay, so in your opinion, just maybe on a piece of paper over there, write down which do you think is the most effective first step in preparing for an exam? Yeah. As with, if we have it in our grade 12 final papers, all you have to do is either write down the A, B, C, or D, or you can write down the, um, the descriptor as well. And you'd be right in saying that creating a study schedule is the most effective first step in preparing for an exam. So what that looks like, and I know this sounds a bit like life orientation at the moment, is that you've got all your subjects mapped out. But when it comes to, let's say, English home language, make sure that you've got all of your paper one, paper two, paper three mapped out, all the things that you need to study for those papers, um, then then you make sure that you've got all bases covered. Don't leave yourself going, well, I didn't really study any of the language things because I was focusing on my literature. Um, and if you don't do that, then you're going to fall short in that regard. Right, then, second question. When is it advisable to start revising for an exam? Is it A, the day before the exam? B, a week before the exam? C, as soon as the exam dates are announced? Or D, after studying all the material once? Okay, so this is not such an easy one because sometimes we don't have the time to study. Okay, so maybe we might be forced to study the day before exam or the week before the exam or as soon as the day, exam dates are announced, or we'd prefer to study everything all at once and then focus on the exam preparation. But in reality, what we need to be looking at is as soon as the exam dates are announced. Okay, so guys, you've got your, hopefully when you get back to school, you'll have your prelim exam timetables given to you. Um, hopefully, you know, sort of you'll have all of that preparation in advance. I know that certainly at our schools, we we try to give as much forewarning as possible. Um, and then also with matric, and I don't know if this happened at your school, um, in the past, they used to give quite directed sort of preparation. Oh, so we're learning um, terms one and two for this exam or terms three and four for that exam, or we're covering this poetry or that poetry. Now you guys are getting to a stage where all of it is relevant. Um, I always joke with my learners when they, when they ask, oh, so what can we prepare for the exam? And, and I jokingly tell them 12 years of English. Um, what you learned in grade um, one and grade two and grade three, there might be words that you learned to read in at that time. There might be spelling mistakes that you made from that time. Those are the things that could crop up in your exam. Right. So let's have a look at the next question. How can past paper exam papers be best used in exam preparation? Okay. Do we? A, ignore them completely. B, using them to understand exam patterns and practice time management. C, reading the questions without attempting them, just being aware of what the questions are. Or D, memorizing answers from them. Now, with language, 
and certainly with creative writing, you can see that some of those do not fit. Um, and you would be right in saying, if you use them to understand exam patterns and you practice time management, this doesn't mean that we ignore the questions, but that we actually answer them under some of the conditions that we would be seeing or experiencing in a final exam. So you all know that paper one language, or you should know by now, paper one language is a two hour paper. It's a 70 mark paper. Um, it comprises of five questions. It'll be the same five subsections in all of the exams. So those are the things that we know about. So we need to practice answering those exam papers in a two hour time period. And and grade 12s, um, I'm also part of the, the marking team that goes marking at the end of the year. And I know how many people struggle to finish, in particular, the language paper. Um, they seem to run out of time and they do certain sections, they rush them very, very quickly. And, and so what happens is they don't give themselves the opportunity to answer the exam as effectively as possible. And I'm hoping that none of you will fall into that category, that you're rushing through an exam paper because you haven't managed your time. Past paper exam practice helps you do that to make sure that I use the time um, fully. Also grade 12s, if I can chip in over here with regards to time management. Nothing more frustrates me when I am invigilating a paper, either at the end of the year or any exam or any test series, and I see that people finish it in under half the time. Um, remember, grade 12s, there's a lot at stake with these final exams, and, and I'm working on the basic idea here that you guys want to do as well as possible to make not only yourselves and your teachers proud to make your moms and dads proud about getting that result and so i would encourage you please 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 utilize the full exam time use the two hours given you and um, i'll go over with regards to the instructions for the exams, the time allocations that they give with regards to the various sections. Right, so multiple choice questions out of the way. I'm just wanting to, and I apologize if um, I, you know, talk a lot. This is an online forum, so I'm going to be talking. If there are any questions, make a note of them. I'm sure your teachers will be able to send them through and we can deal with some of those issues. Right, so preparing for your language examination. Um, do you start right from the beginning? Because if your school um, was is part of a WCED school and you have this rollout of textbooks, you might have had a different language textbook from grade eight to grade 12. Um, or alternatively, as we have been known to do, we um, will roll out um, packs of notes to our learners based on the things that we think that they are needed. And we use those in terms of preparing them for the right language concepts. But um, you don't know what's going to, to, to come at you. So five things that I've said, or six things that I've said with regards to, um, to preparing the exam. Use those past papers. Now, past papers, if your school doesn't have them on file, or if your teacher might have um, loose past papers from, from years gone by, um, they are available on the Department of Education DBE website and also on the WCED ePortal. So if you log on there, you've got access to this wealth of resources um, and, and it really is valuable. This is one of the most effective ways of studying for your examinations. The past papers will guide you. 
um, you will see if you look at the past papers, past papers for the last five years, those are particularly important, and I'll tell you why. Because the examination panel that has set your matric final exam are the same that have set those. So the questions will be similar. And, and I'm not talking about they will be the same. They, they never repeat a question. Let's put that out of the way. But they will be similar. So if you have a look at the structure, and I will talk to some of those things as we go ahead. Um, but if you have a look at the structure, it is very, very, very similar to what was in last year's paper to what was in the year before's paper. And you'll even notice that there's a May-June exam and those papers are the same. When it comes to paper one language, they are very, very similar. And so you can pick up certain patterns and certain trends. The second point that I've said there is know the predictables and the non-predictables. Now, um, predictables, or let's talk about non-predictables first. Non-predictables are things like you don't know what the comprehension passage is going to be about. It could be anything, and hopefully it's a topic that is of relevance to you, and it's something that you know something about. Um, I, say, I tell my learners, even in grade 11, in fact, more importantly in grade 11, read as much and as widely around topical issues that pertain to the youth. Um, so go to news sites or whatever, read things like um, what is happening in maybe employment or what are skills that you need in terms of living life properly. Or um, there was a comprehension passage, what is the, the fourth industrial revolution? Um, and and things like that, which the examiners deem to be really, really important, but also topical for the youth of today. Social media is the one that you had in terms of your um, your June common paper. And so you can see that these topics are geared towards knowledge that you might have something about. OK, so if you haven't read or, you know, so if you don't read widely up until this point in time, by all means, if you've got access to newspapers, um, news sites on cell phones or computers or, you know, however you access the media, start, you know, sort of getting ideas and start thinking about potential topics that they might um, set comprehension passages about. Um, so those are the non-predictables. Now, when I talk about predictables, if you have a look, if you had to line up, let's say, five past papers in front of you, if you have to have them all set out, you will notice that there are certain types of questions that will always crop up. So, for instance, there will be a question that asks you to... Um, your understanding of what the the title is and how it relates to the passage. If you look at the passages and you see that there's a one line paragraph, a single sentence, they're going to ask you about that. Um, there's going to be a question that will ask you about the diction of a particular paragraph. Now remember diction, and I hope your teachers have dealt with were this with you, and I also hope that you picked it up in the Home Language Paper 2 presentation from Monday, that the diction are the words used. And so, very simply, if, if, if I'm an examiner and I'm sitting in exam paper, whether for school or whether for the district or whoever I sit an exam paper for, I always look for a passage where there are words that have not only the denotation, the literal meaning, but also connotation, where we can see emotions coming out, where we can see attitudes coming out. And we've got one in the paper that we're going to be referring to today, and you'll see what I mean when we say this. Right. Then, third point, make sure you understand what's required of you. Um, home language paper one is easy. You've got to answer all the questions. It's as simple as that. 
And so you need to know that I've got so many questions in the following format to answer in so much time. And we'll, again, it's the, it's the time factor that we will deal with. Do the past papers and reflect on the answers. Now, word of warning, grade 12s. If you have downloaded or printed out or had access to past papers, and then you access the marking guideline, um, remember the marking guideline is a guide, okay? So it's not um, prescriptive. So if you've got another idea and you're able to argue that point, then the markers at the end of the year should give you credit for that. Ah, that makes sense in the context of this passage. I think that's a valid answer, and you might you will you will get the marks for that answer. Um, so it's really really important that you think through the questions. That it's not just a an answer that you find in the passage and you write down on. You've got to argue many of the points, and and we'll we'll come to those ideas. And then the last thing that I've I've put there is a cheat sheet. Um, so a cheat sheet is please don't um, don't think that I'm advocating that you cheat in an exam. I would never, um, and you should not. But a cheat sheet is literally all the concepts that you have or you need to study or could crop up in an exam on a particular page, and you've given a definition of what the concept is. So let's say, for instance, there's a question on in question five on active to passive voice. You've got a definition for that, and then you've got an example. So you know what to do when that happens. It just makes your preparation for examinations that much easier. Um, I've got two cheat sheets that I give to my learners ahead of their examinations to help them prepare for it. Now, obviously, they don't have these in the exams. Please, <laughs> um, that is never, never the right um, answer is to take the shortcut, but rather to understand um, some of the ideas that are in the exams and to work towards that. Right, then, um, every single exam looks the same at the front, um, and it's got the instructions for the learners, um, and you'll see that these things, um, hopefully your, your teachers have given you the same format on any language exam that you've you've given. Okay, so so basically um, it will give you a breakdown of the paper one instruction. So the question paper consists of three sections, section A, section B, section C. But we know that section A is one question, section B is one question, which is the summary, and section C consists of three questions, each of 10 marks. And this should help you manage your time. Um, it's really, really important that we, when you have a look at all these exam papers that you're preparing for, that you understand the same, the same structure, the same section goes for all of these. The comprehension, the summary, the advertisement, question three, the visual literacy, which is a cartoon for question four, and then the editing section, or as they used to call it, language and context, which I always used to love, okay, uh, in question five. That language and context, that editing question, is the one where you will do the most learning in terms of the marks. And, and grade 12s, please hear, hear me when I say this. The language and context is not just things that you, um, that you have have learnt over the years and you don't really want to prepare them and they dry um, grammar concepts or whatever. If you prepare this, this should be an accessible, easy, let's say eight to 10 marks if you've learned this. But if you're anything like my learners and, and I love them to bits, this is the one where they don't really want to um, prepare all as much. So they 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 skim over it and it's like, oh yeah, active to passive or direct to indirect, yeah, yeah, yeah. We knew it, we learned it in grade nine. And then they get into an exam and they 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 kind of space out. Okay. They they don't remember what um those concepts are. 
those are the ones that I would recommend that you prepare closest to the time so that when they crop up in an exam, you go, aha, I know that question, I do that. Um, also, and this is an important um, part there, I've highlighted the time. Okay, so section A, they say is 50 minutes. That's the comprehension. And because it means reading this text of about 700 words, answering these 11 questions, um, they you you should take your time and most people do but if you spend longer than 50 minutes know that you're going to have to make up time elsewhere because the comprehend the the summary passage is also one where you've got to read the whole passage and understand it for the points um section c there are three different questions and they're shorter questions so you know you might spend your time um answering those questions but if you've gone over time on the comprehension you might be stealing time from one of the others which means that generally the last question that you answer answer which is question five is done under unnecessary pressure so so please again manage your time um if you're running over time with regards to section a um i don't say come back to it if you've got time but please be aware of your time as you go along, right? Read all the instructions carefully, answer all the questions. Those are the things that I've said. Start each section on a new page and rule off, off after each section. Now, you might think, well, you know what, as long as I get the answers down on paper, and I'm talking towards the end of the year now, you know, so um, your teacher's going to mark your prelim paper, and that's great. Um, or they might mark it as a team. Sometimes we do it where we mark section by section at our school um, just to prepare our learners for the fact that uh, Mr. Pringle knows what your handwriting looks like. And uh, he can, after having taught you for a year or two, he can decipher that language or whatever. And he knows what I'm saying. So it's OK. I can write like I want to. But someone else does it now. Grade 12, so you need to realize at the end of the year, this is your only interaction with the markers. You will write in a very official looking book, okay? And if your examination looks horrible, if it's all over the place and your ideas are all over the place and your handwriting is 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 untidy, and, and you guys probably know in your classes, and you're probably looking at that person right now, you know, whose handwriting is untidy. Remember, this is like your CV that you're submitting to the marker to create a good impression. And what we ask from you is you create the best impression that you can. You create that impression which says to the markers this person is worthy of high marks because their their work has been set out clearly and it's good stuff right so those are the instructions they don't change be aware of them um, and and pay special attention to them um, you know you will read these in the reading time that you get before an examination right so Today's focus, and I've taken a while to get there, is on comprehension. Um, and what I've done is I've had a look at the last couple of years' papers, and, and these are the types of things that they've included as comprehension passages. So remember 2020, we our lives changed um, radically. Um, the comprehension passage after that was laughter in the time of pandemic. Um, the next one was listening instead of reading is not cheating. So again, remember we are English teachers. We love to give you topical to comments and topical topics, um, things that we think that should be important to you and, and understand. So listening instead of reading, um, a nice topical um, idea there. The age of intimacy famine, which dealt with um, how social media and um, technology is taking away our one-on-one -on -one connection with one another. And you'll see that that is quite a, 
um, a strong theme that's come through in the last couple of years. And then the old have made a mess of the world, the young will save us. Um, so something about the youth there. Right. As I said, there's no way to really predict what the text will be about. Um, but if you've read widely, you know, it's sort of you should be for forearmed, forewarned is forearmed, as they say. It will be something that you as the youth would know something about or an opinion that you share. So read topical articles around issues that you think the examiners or even your teachers think um, would engage you. So that that's really, really um, that non-predictable, the unpredictable that I, I talked about. That's one way of making that less. Right. So let's have a look at the common paper that we um, wrote do, during June. Um, this was a district common paper. And so a lot of the same rules will apply. These papers have been set up, um, grade 12s, to give you the idea of what it's like to be sitting in that matric final, that the questions are the same, they're the same format. There's nothing that you shouldn't have encountered beforehand that you will not see in a matric final. Okay, remember the... Um, the section A, the text was how social media is a toxic mirror. Um, the first comprehension is always going to be, or the comprehension is always going to be a 30 mark question. Text A will always be plus or minus 700, 750, maybe 800 words. Um, and at the end of the year, when we do the evaluation of the paper, we comment on that. We actually count the number of words in the comprehension passage. Right, and then text B will be a visual and a text um, attached to that visual. So it might be a graphic, it could be a cartoon, it could be an advertisement dealing with the same thing that is covered in the um, comprehension passage. Please pay attention to the paragraphs and line numbers because these direct you to the um, the questions direct you to these a lot of the time. And this really um, is very difficult to, to mark at the end of the year, where you can see people have discussed things from the text, but not from that paragraph. And so all of a sudden, the answer is not relevant. We cannot credit the marks or whatever. So make sure that you focus there. So, just to give you an, a, a, a couple of tips with regards to reading the passage. Um, you should all be given, and I hope that they're doing this as part of your examinations already, 10 minutes reading time before an examination. That's when your pens are down, your scripts are open, or your exam papers are open, okay? And you're just reading to get a sense of what is in the paper. Great 12s, this is not a, uh, a time where you can just, you know, sort of look around and, and send to yourself or whatever, but use this time productively. A lot of the time, you should be having a look at the structure of the paper and seeing that those predictables are there. But alternatively, what you can do is start asking questions about the passages that you read. So read through your comprehension passage read through it and make sure that you have some idea. And please, grade 12s, at this point in time, do not panic. Do not panic. We hear horror stories every single year where there's a particularly difficult paper. Um, I remember the one where the, the whole idea was cultural appropriation. And immediately people saw the title cultural appropriation and didn't know what it was. Now, of course, nowadays, it's, it's a lot more topical, and I hope that we all have some idea of what that cultural appropriation or cultural appropriation means. But it came across as, as a concept that many people saw for the first time. And there were stories of people that, that just put their heads down and, and almost at the beginning of the exam gave up. And that's not what we want to have um, it, 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 it does nothing for you. Remember, the examiners have deemed this to be a topic 
that you should know something about and that you should be fairly familiar with. So start from the one side and just break it down. Okay, so the first question, does the title give me an idea of what is in the passage? Have a look at it. What do what am I expecting? OK, so social media is a toxic mirror. OK, this has got to do with social media. A mirror is something that we look at ourselves in and we see a reflection of ourselves. But a toxic mirror is a mirror that distorts our image of ourself in a negative or a, a harmful way. Remember, toxic refers to something that is poisonous. And all of a sudden we should expect now in terms of the passage, something that deals with a reflection of ourselves, social media, reflection of ourself, and it is poisonous. Okay. Are there words that I don't understand? Um, and this for me is is something that, you know, sort of is really, really important. Um, don't skim over a passage and go, well, actually, I don't understand it. And, and, and that's okay. I'll just... I'll just make it up as I go along. But rather, you know, sort of in your mind, start flagging those ideas that pot potentially might be something that you don't understand. Um, a third idea that you start thinking about, remember, this is pens up, no, um, no pens. You can't scribble on your papers. I always wish that we could because it would help you. Um, but what is the writer's opinion of his or her topic? Is she supportive of it? Is she critical of it? And basically, you'll see that between two sides, you know, they will either be supportive of it, they will either be critical of it, or they would tr uh, try to inform you of certain issues around it, surrounding that topic, topic. So remember, social media, toxic mirror, they are critical of social media. And already we know where we can approach the topic. Right. Has the writer used words that are emotive? So flag some of those. And remember, emotive words are any ideas or words that might stir up either a negative or a positive emotion. Remember, again, critical versus um, celebratory or supportive. Those kinds of ideas should be going through our minds. And then lastly, in a nutshell, what is the main message of the text? OK, if I had to close my eyes right now and say, what is the main message of this text that I have? Um, is it that social media should be they should do away with social media? Is it something that um, we should perhaps learn how to use social media properly and those kinds of things? So so what is the main message? of the text that the writers presented right remember all of these things should if if you have a look at those things then the questions should make a bit more sense right so um as soon as the examiners or oh, sorry the invigilators tell you right um okay end of reading you may now begin don't just dive in and want to answer the first question, but rather my recommendation is that you've got either a different colored pen or a highlighter and that you've gone back and you're rereading and you're flagging those important pieces of the text. OK, so if there's a question about um, social media or it's a question about the title, you highlight the title. If they refer to a particular line reference, you highlight that line reference. This just makes it easier that when you go back and you answer the questions, that you go straight back there. You're not having to look for aging down of smartphone ownership, which was a question in the text. Right. So we've talked about the mirror reflecting our image. We've talked about how it's poisonous or unhealthy. And we're talking about social media leading to poor self image. They're the two first um, paragraphs over there and and I'm going to read through them and please note where I've highlighted because I think those are important concepts okay so the paragraph one says we've long understood that movies magazine and television damage teens body image by enforcing a thin ideal okay so what do we understand by a thin ideal everybody needs to be thin that's what 
the media likes, right? Lesser known is the impact of social media on body confidence. With the rapid aging down of smartphone ownership highlighted there, why? Because it's part of the question, most parents spend digital parenting time on character coaching, making sure their kids think before they post comments and refrain from cyberbullying. For at least a decade, educators like me have argued that social media's biggest threat was its light likeness to a bathroom wall letting teens sling insults with recklessness that comes only with anonymity. Not anymore. Social media has also become a toxic mirror. So when I think about this, this first passage, it's dealing with a number of things. Firstly, we've always understood that social media might be negative. We've always understood that social media might be bad. However, we've understood it as being bad from the fact that cyberbullying can take place, uh, that people can post things on social media that they that people can't actually um, respond to or fight back from and that type of thing. It's kind of like posting everything that you you feel that you want to express or whatever that's negative and it's out there and nothing can be done. However, they're looking at it from the perspective of saying, well, social media is also something that affects us. Okay, we look at social media and the feedback that people give us or what we see on social media and we see a negative idea of ourselves. Okay, so it's not only what we do or can do to other people, but it's also what is done to us. Right. Um, if we have a look at words and phrases that you don't understand in a passage, um, there are a number of ways of figuring those out. So I've said they don't panic because more often than not, we'll, we'll have this passage that is written by someone who is not 17 year old or 18 years old, okay, has used words and phrases and ideas or concepts that we don't understand. And so instead of just zoning out and saying, this is so difficult, I, I don't get it, okay, slow down, don't panic, okay. And a couple of things that we can look at in terms of um, things that, that we look at. Firstly, um, does it look like or sound like something, like another word, okay, which might be related? So um, is it similar to that? And does that fit into the line? Basically, so uh, a word that we might look at um, that is, is difficult to understand. If I, if I go back to the passage over here, we might um, struggle with a concept like digital parenting. Okay, and digital parenting would be, okay, it's dealing with, you know, sort of how parents help their their children in terms of looking at digital things. And digital parenting is spent time on character coaching. Um, rather, so parents are talking to their, their, their kids about um, don't be aggressive or don't be insulting. Um, the character issues over there, but but what they're saying is that did the parents in the way that they deal with their 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 kids on the digital in the digital framework should be dealing with things like are you okay, how does that make you feel, and um, and changing the the effect or the the focus right. So it looks like sounds like. Secondly, does it affect my meaning or is it part of the question? So if you have a question set on that particular line or that particular phrase or that particular word and I don't understand it, is it going to affect the way that I answer this question? If not, fine. Fine and well. Okay. Um, but if it's relevant to the question, then perhaps we need to figure it out or spend a bit more time. Right. Then the third question is, can I figure it out from the paragraph? Um, if I read this in context, is this something that is supportive of the topic or unsupportive of the topic? 
um, can I figure it out what that might mean? And so you get this idea of generally what words or phrases might mean. And then lastly, check the glossary at the end of it. Um, believe it or not, the glossary has only been in play for about eight, maybe 10 years, if, if that. Before that, there was no help given to people in a matric final exam um, with regards to how they could answer it. And so, so there would be words there which learners didn't know, but that's okay. You know, and their whole idea was this is home language. Uh, you either have the skills to figure it out or you should know these words anyway. Right. Then we look at the questions and I want to leave this image with you. On the right hand side there is a very intricate um, spaceship that's been made out of Lego. Um, and, you know, sometimes we look at a question as this intricate spaceship made out of Lego. True story, um, when I wrote my matric, I wrote the language paper, the language component, and I couldn't have told you what I expected to get for that exam. I couldn't have told you. I answer these questions, but I didn't know if I was answering them correctly. I didn't have any idea of, am I doing the right things? I just pretty much did what I thought the question asked you to, but I didn't know if I would get one or two or three or four marks for it. I didn't know. Um, and my English teacher went up to me and said, so what did you think you got for the exam afterwards? And and uh, I said to him, I don't know. And he was he was quite um, he was quite sort of disturbed by that. He says, "How can you not know what?" You... I said, "Like I answered the questions, but whether I got them right, I don't know." Here's the thing, grade twelves, you should be able to predict um, how you get or how many marks you're going to get for an exam paper, and I'll show you why. So what I want you to do is with the questions, the most valuable skill is to break it down into the building blocks of the question. Each question is has got various components to it. And I'm hoping that they they dealt with uh, in terms of um, the paper two session. And I hope your teachers have taught you this, but, but you break it down and you make sure that you understand that you've covered all the various bits of the question. Okay, I always tell my learners, answer the question backwards. Now, I'm not literally telling them answer the question backwards, but if you look from left to right, you read a question and you might miss certain things. But if you read it from right to left, it's in a, your brain gets, gets um, I don't want to say tricked, but it is, it gets tricked into picking up the things that you should um, be looking at. You know, so if we read question 1.1, okay, what do you understand by the expression aging down of smartphone ownership, line three, two marks? Um, it's a fairly predictable question. And this is what we call an entry level question. It's easy. But remember, guys, um, easy questions very often are the ones where you only get one mark out of two instead of the full two marks. And remember, guys, if we're losing one or two marks on every single question, we're going to struggle to make that 40% mark at the end of the um, at the end of the the exam session. So you're wanting to make sure that you've given two marks worth of answers. Um, I say this because it frustrates me no end that when I have learners in my grade 8, 9, 10, 11, even my 12 classes that haven't answered the questions as fully as possible, it's frustrating because you say, okay, you've given me one mark's worth of answers there, and it's correct, but where do you think the second mark comes from? And you should be approaching these questions from the same, um, the same perspective. So I'm just going to talk through this, and then what I want you to do is, based on what I've asked you, what I've said to you, Okay, you've all got the um, the questions in front of you. You've got the the passage I've project projected. I want you to relook at at answering these two questions. Okay, so we start from the right hand side. Okay, first thing I'm looking at is the marks. Two marks over there, which in home language doesn't mean one idea. Okay, it could mean 
one idea that I've said something more about. So I've identified the idea. This is what I see. And this is what it means. There's my two marks. OK, or it could mean two ideas. So two marks really, really important. Marks show me how many points or ideas I need to give. OK, so if I go into this question with the idea that I've got to say two things about this, then I can expect two marks. OK, right. So that's the first point that um, I have there. Right, if I look at that point, right, then the second thing is the paragraph or line reference that tells me where I must look for the answer. And this is where I recommend it. You go through with a highlighter. I've highlighted line three based on the questions. Then I look at what the topic or the focus words are. Aging down of smartphone ownership. That's in line three. OK, it's going to ask me something about that. What do I understand about aging down of smartphone ownership? Right. And then lastly, what does the question require? These are what we call STEM words. These are uh, or question stems. These are the, the doing words. They might be the verbs that we have. And um, the one thing that I like about the textbook that we have at our school is at the at the back where it gives exam techniques. They give a breakdown of all of these. The other thing that I like about it is when you look at exams next to one another. Um, so 2021, 22, 23, 24 past papers, you'll see that they don't use many different STEM words. It's explain, it's discuss, it's account for, it's critically discuss, it's comment on, it's critically comment on. Those are the big ones that we use time and time again. And so it's quite easy then to know what I need to do for those. Right. If I look at the second question, OK, again, two marks. So this should be um, guiding me. I need to say two things. Right. But what two things? It's in line seven. OK, focus the topic words, teens sling insults with the recklessness that comes with only with anonymity. OK, and then the last thing, explain over there. Right. So. If I look at these two questions and I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to give you three minutes to answer them because they should be relatively easy. In question one, what do you understand by the expression aging down of smartphone ownership? Are there two things that I can say there? Aging down, smartphone ownership, okay? And then question 1.2, explain what the writer means by teen sling insults with the recklessness that comes only with anonymity. You can actually find three things to say there. Um, and if you, impact, if you unpack those three things. Right, grade 12, hear me. An examiner or a marker cannot understand if you've understood a concept if you are using the words from the passage. OK, so for instance, 1.1, if you'd say, well, it means that smartphone ownership is aging down. That tells us nothing as to whether you've understood the the concept. So now we've got to start putting it down into our own words. OK, aging down. What does that mean? Um, smartphone ownership. What does that mean? And we'll see what happens when we get to the marking guidelines. So I've got to find two things there. OK. And then the second one, teen sling insults with recklessness that only comes with anonymity. I know you've answered these in your um, in your June exam, but can I ask you quickly to answer questions one or two? I'm going to give you three minutes just to answer these two questions.
Right, great. Well, I have just been informed that we are going to be pushed for time and I don't want you to um, not get the benefit of the whole session. So I'm going to ask you just to wrap up your responses in about another 10 seconds or so, and then we can um, then we can move on. Okay, right. So if if we have a look at um, answering this question, okay, there's our, our passage over there. If I had to answer this, I would have looked at um, smartphone owners used to be adults, um, but now younger children have their own cell phone. So aging down talks about younger children have their own cell phone or own their own cell phones. Smartphone owners used to be adults. Um, if I have a look at the answer, it says younger children now own smartphones. Previously, and there's the hook, because you've got to include both of these, um, teens and adults were the only ones that would buy and own these, uh, these types of phones. Okay, so you can see where the two marks are com coming from. And this is where I said, you know, to my frustration comes in that sometimes we just say, oh, smartphone owners um, are young children. But that would only get you the one out of the two. Remember also, um, towards the end of the, the year, we do tend to see things as being um, entry level questions. So it might be easier to get the two marks. Right. The second question there. If I had to answer it, teenagers insult one another because they don't think that they can get caught. So that's the anonymity, okay, um, and the insulting one another. Or alternatively, because they're online, no one knows who they are. That's the the, the two ideas that we, we've got over there. Now, if you look at the, the answer there, the teenagers have a false sense of bravado, okay, and they do not feel responsible for what they say or post okay that would give you two marks there they've they've got the sense of recklessness that was in the passage okay bravado basically means that i do things without thinking and i'm arrogant in doing it that kind of thing okay and they do not feel responsible that's also the um the the recklessness of anonymity right grade 12 just a heads up um, when you do and you look at past papers, I just want to indicate those little slashes in between these points. Okay, I don't know if you can see them, I have highlighted them. When you do past papers, and perhaps you do a, a DBE past paper, where you see that little forward slash there, that means an or. So what goes before that should give you two marks. And then the next should be giving you two marks and then the next so so basically this marking guideline um, response over here should has six marks worth of um of responses that you could have okay but those can't fall or you could have said that or you could have said that or you could have said that also um, and it's something that we push ourselves very hard with regards to being examiners or being markers um, we understand that you don't have the language that would appear in a marking guideline like this, but we can tie back to or interpret. Okay, you've got that concept, you've got that idea, we credit it for you. Okay, so don't panic the fact that you don't answer at this level of language, but rather you say and your answers come through um, importantly. Right. I just want to move on to 1.3, 1.4. In order to respect your time, um, I'm going to just talk through the remainder of the comprehension passage because I do want to spend some time with paper three because it's really, really important. Okay. So 1.3, the question was, what is the effect of the single line paragraph? Okay. My top tip for answering a two mark question here and please, it, on your exam script or whatever, write this down. I'm not going to ask you to answer it, okay? Um, always have one mark that says the effect. Okay, what is the effect of a single line paragraph? And it's something like it highlights an idea. It um, gives uh, 
the writer's opinion or, it, uh, you know, that type of thing. Or it, and the second mark um, should come from the text. So what is the effect of the single line paragraph? It highlights the writer's view that the toxic um, mirror is something negative or hurts the people. So you're always talking about what's in the paragraph. OK, don't just say it highlights the reader's idea or the writer's idea or it engages the reader, but always answer the to what. Remember what we said about the one versus the two. OK, and I've, I've put over there the effect or the context and the, the, the one mark and the context. OK, so an effect could be it emphasizes, it highlights, it uh, draws attention to. OK, the second question referred to paragraph four, lines 14 to 16. The most vulnerable users, researchers say, are the ones who spend most of their time posting, comment on and comparing themselves to photos. OK, comment on the implication of the sentence in context. Now remember guys, this is not just a what is he saying, but rather you've got to give a comment. What does this mean? Right, the term in context over there, which is in the passage, refers to the topic or the text. Okay, so what does it mean in this passage? Okay, comment on or analyze or assess why does the writer say that? And it's very important that we know those stem words, comment on. So comment on the implication of the sentence in the context. So we're talking about the context, okay? It's about social media and those that are posting on social media or commenting in social media, okay? And what does it mean? Well, it's generally those that need help the most, the most vulnerable users, those that are most insecure that post comments. And so um, they shouldn't be posting comments because they also suffer from those insecurities. And, and we know that very often the biggest bullies, let's say, or cyber bullies are ones that actually um, fear bullying the most. So that's basically what it's saying. Right. I've said they always try to frame your answers into your own words. This is how we can see that you have understood the questions. Chunk lifting, which means if we just quote from the passage, okay, well, if, if it's credited in the marking guideline, it will get you one out of two or one out of three. If it's credited, if it's not credited, it's a zero. Because again, the marker cannot see that you've understood the question. So rephrase the question for your own understanding if you're not too sure what it's asking you. OK, so basically I would rephrase this. What is the what is being implied um, by the sentence about social media? OK, and I would then answer it. OK, um, right. So this is the the. Guideline response the writer brings the topic into focus as it highlights okay there's your one mark that's the effect the damaging effect of self-obsession which has been brought about by social media okay there's your second mark so remember 1.3 single line the effect it highlights it brings into focus it explains it brings attention to okay and the damaging effect that's the context OK, right. One point four. And we're moving on here. Um, what am I doing? I'm putting this into my own words and then I'm giving a comment on those who should avoid exposure. Actually put themselves in the spotlight. That's what it's saying, which jeopardizes their already fragile self-esteem. OK, they should not be doing this. OK, they are in danger if they are commenting on social media topics and that type of thing, they stand a chance of being bullied. The ones most fragile are the ones most affected. And there's your, your two words there. Award no more than one mark if they've said that. Right. Um, as I say, I want to respect your time. So we are going to move on. Um, I've got 1.5 and then we'll we'll drop down to the, the text Bs. Right. Um, this question is the diction question. Discuss how the diction in paragraph five reveals the writer's attitude towards the way in which social media are used. Okay, 
Remember, work backwards. We're looking at three marks, so either three things or discussing two things about this. Okay, so we might need to look at two examples of diction. Right, diction questions, quote one or two examples of diction that you're going to talk about. So in this paragraph, I've highlighted selfieholics, makeup or applying makeup, great democratizer, Democratizer means democracy means that we all have a say. So online, we all have a say in how we look and how we can present ourselves. OK, perhaps what social media have done is to let everyone into the beauty pageant. That's that could be a positive or a negative, but generally it's used as a negative. OK, teens can cover up pimples, whiten teeth and even airbrush with the swipe of a finger curating their own image to become prettier, thinner, hotter. Now, the, the diction here, guys, is not positive. It's actually quite critical. And it's saying it's very easy for people to look beautiful or prettier or hotter, okay, negative, um, just by adjusting our images on social media. Okay, and then the... STEM word discuss, write about how words have been used in the text. So if we work backwards, we've got to say what the writer's attitude is. The writer's attitude is critical. Okay, building your answer. What is the attitude? And then you quote one or two examples of diction. So he's critical because he says selfieholics. Okay, uses the word selfieholics, which means that social media is almost like an addiction. He sees social media as an addiction, and that is a negative. Okay, or he sees it as a great democratizer. It means that we're all the same. We're not individual. We're unique. Okay, swipe of a finger. It's easy. Okay, so we can be become pretty online easily. And so you are discussing those words and how they relate to the attitude. Note with attitude, make sure that you are not too vague. Okay, an attitude is never he likes it or he dislikes it. He is happy or he is sad. He is positive or he is negative. We're wanting descriptors and we'll see with tone in the next question that this is really, really important in terms of um, being specific, right? This is what the guideline said, the writer's use of deprecating terms. Deprecating means um, critical. He's looking down on them. He's being, um, yeah, he's being critical of them, such as selfie-holics, democratizer, curating. Underscore her aversion means that she does not like it. And she, it's not just does not like it, she, she hates it. Aversion to the narcissism, the dishonesty presented by the range of applications. She is critical of teenagers' obsession with social media. She is contemptuous of the illusion of perfection that is afforded by the applications on social media. If you had said something like she, she dislikes it intensely or she hates it, okay, because she uses words like this and she compares them to, to that, then you've, you've got the idea. Um, but you've always got to have that one and two parts. And with a diction question, and I hope they covered this with paper two as well, if they ask you about the diction, quote diction. Okay, go back to the words and they say in the passage, it says this, this means that, which says that the attitude is that. And there you've got your three marks. Okay, right. Then 1.6, um, I've highlighted here because it is what we call a tone question and tone questions always you'll you'll see you'll have a diction question you'll have a tone question you'll have an attitude question those are what we call the predictables in the paper okay so in this paper it was referred to paragraph 8 comment on the writer's tone in this paragraph and remember tone is an emotion okay it's not loud or soft it's not, um, you know, high tone or low tone. Those are responses that we get a lot, okay? But rather, how, what tone of voice would the writer be saying this? Okay, so if I read it aloud to you, 
What teens share online is dwarfed by what they consume. Pre-internet, you had to hoof it to the grocery store to find a magazine with celebrity bodies or at least filch your mother's copy from the bathroom. Now the pictures are as endless as they are available. Teens can spend hours fixating on the toned arms or glutes of celebrity who hawk their bodies as much as their talent. So you can see there's a definite tone in that, um, in that paragraph there. Okay, the writer's tone is critical, could be satirical. Remember, satire is when we poke fun of something, okay, um, and it conveys a serious underlying message, okay. So the serious underlying message here is that teens can spend hours fixating with the image. They're obsessed with unhealthy body images. Teenagers are willing participate participants who are brainwashed by social media okay award one mark for the identification of tone okay so tone question when you see it start your thing with the writer's tone is okay we're working backwards comment on the writer's tone the writer's tone is and you say what the writer's tone is and then how we see this okay they say that um teens are spend hours fixating on toned arms or glutes. This means that they are obsessed with it and the writer does not like that. Right, basically what I want to, I, I did want to spend a little bit of time, but we, against time is against us over here. If we have a look at this picture, we'll see different facial expressions. We'll see people that are um, excited, we'll see them ecstatic, we'll see people that are thinking. The gentleman to the left over here, you can see there's a very, very sad gentleman, but he's not just sad, he's, he's mourning. Um, and so as many different types of facial expressions that you see in this picture, perhaps there are different types of tones that people will use. Um, Great twelves, we don't give marks for positive or negative or happy or sad or possibly even angry. Um, we look for something that is more descriptive. Okay, so if a person is happy, are they content? Are they excited? Or are they celebrating something? Okay, remember, those are the kinds of ideas that we want to come through. Don't just go happy or sad, positive or negative, okay? It's got to be content. It's got to be excited, celebratory. Sadness can be, are they mourning? Are they, um, are they uh, you know, sort of depressed? Are they um, looking at something that is, is, you know, it's not just sad. Sad is so broad that, you know, it's too vague to use in a question. Remember, guys, when I said home language is um, difficult. Right. Question seven, critically discuss whether paragraph nine supports the title of the article. OK. And here you've got to say something about paragraph nine and you've got to say something about the paragraph or the title of the article. OK. So the question requires you to compare the concepts from the title. And remember, we talked about those social media toxic mirror. It's a negative self um, image and how social media creates that. Okay. And what does what in paragraph nine supports that? And if you read through paragraph nine, I'm not going to spend time here, but basically it talks about the wellness industry or the health industry that promotes a very, very unhealthy body image. They tell you that you must be thinner. They tell you that you must be in the guise of saying you will be healthy. Okay, but actually it's just telling you to be skinny because um, that's what people like to see. And that's a negative thing. Right, quick response there. Okay, paragraph nine fully supports the idea that social media can be seen as toxic. It's unhealthy. The poison spread by social media is responsible for the damage caused to people's health. That's one point. The writer has established the wellness industry, which pervades the internet, okay, paradoxically makes people unwell. 
So you've got both sides of the argument over there. You've talked about paragraph nine and you've talked about the topic. OK, the claim that wellness is a stealthy cover for unhealthy habits is justified and validated by the factual information provided. OK, so there's a lot that you can say there. Right. I want to move on to text B. Um, and it's something that my learners did not do um, all that well with this particular question. And, um, you know, sort of, if you see text B and there's a picture involved, start unpacking the question. OK, if you see text B um, over here, there was the picture of the woman. Discuss the appropriateness of the image of the woman. OK, um, there's no detail there. You, you, you don't know what, um, you know, so how tall she is, what she looks like. There's no detail. It's it's it, it, she's not fat, but she's not skinny. OK, and I'm saying that because it's relating to the um, the topic. And we're not too sure what she's holding close to her mouth. So there's there's not much there that we can actually say about this image, which is probably what the examiner or what the um, what the the person putting the image together wanted. OK, so the answer to that appropriateness there, she has no discerning features. OK, so she is there's no detail there. Um, she's not fat. She's not skinny. OK, this makes her representative of women in general. So this could be any woman. OK, and attracts the attention of a wider female audience. So you could say there's no discerning features. She's representative of every any woman. Or you could say that um, she she has been depicted like this to attract the wider image there. Right. And then lastly, and this is a question that, um, you know, sort of many people do not get the full four marks for, and I'm wanting them. OK, question 1.12 is always a comparison. Text A versus text B. Now, guys, um, you don't have to say text A supports text B. Um, you could also make arguments for text A has nothing to do with text B or it doesn't. But you've got to say why. Right. So think of a soccer match. Two people, OK, competing over there. I just noticed that when the image um, that I put into the PowerPoint, they're actually both South African or Bafana players or representative of it. But don't let that get. Let's think of them as opposing teams. OK, so your fourth, first point that you would say is something that comes from paragraph six. 1.12, in your view, does text B support the views expressed in paragraph six and seven of text A? Remember, we can see the outline of the mark here. Paragraph six compared to text B, paragraph seven compared to text B justify your response and that's where you get the marks okay you're not going to get the marks for a yes or a no okay there's no there's no marks for that it depends on how you frame your answer so think of it as player one kicks first point okay text a what do i i've got to say something about text a right then player b kicks the ball back he says the first point of something from text B, either the visual that we see or the text, okay? And then player one, second point, text A from paragraph seven. I've got to say something from paragraph seven. And then the second point, text B from paragraph seven. Can you see how you build your answer there? Grade 12s, okay? You don't just say, oh, they agree with one another because they both talk about body image, okay? That is not going to get you the marks that you need. If the markers are feeling generous, they might give you one mark. But remember, one out of four is not a pass. OK, you're wanting the four there. Right. So um, I've just highlighted over there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click straight through to the the answers. OK, the young woman wants to look prettier. She chooses pictures that make herself look better. That's from uh, paragraph six. OK, then the first point, 54 percent of women are unhappy with their body. OK, that's from the text B there. Right. Then I say the 16 year old talked about that's in paragraph seven. OK, talked about feeling 
appreciated by getting more likes. And in text B, you've got the woman looking at social media sites, Instagram make, uh, or Facebook makes them feel low. Also, how look at the upside down like over there, um, the 64%, that could also talk about not getting the likes that you need. Okay, right. Um, this is what the guideline said. Text B supports and clarifies the views expressed in paragraph six and seven. The quotation, if I could, my uh, if I could, my body would look different, reveals that the woman feels inadequate and therefore has to really work at improving herself. Okay, um, you've got your first point over there. In addition, an illusion is created to influence the perception of others. Okay, that's also from tech, uh, paragraph six. The quest for improvement has been sought about by negative perceptions of their body image as depicted in text B. Now, remember, guys, um, the words that you say these in is going to be different, but you feel free to state it. You've got the ideas. You know the ideas. Just try and say them as clearly as possible. Okay, right. Statistics such as 64% of women how they feel about their body there's your text b okay mirror the dissatisfaction with body image expressed by the young woman in paragraph six so you've got your 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 six marks over there um there's a, an additional over here which we pointed the thumbs down icon in text b gives the converse of the like mentioned in, in paragraph seven so there's a potential of six marks that we've given here okay the guideline says a no response is unlikely, but consider each response on its merit. OK, and sometimes you'll get that in a guideline, um, which means that even if you didn't agree with it, OK, or you found that they didn't match up and you've said that you should still get the marks. But remember, make sure that your meaning is clear. OK, right. To leave this part of the section, I want to say, just tell you about a story. Once a shy boy who kicked a ball against the walls of his small village now roared in stadiums packed with thousands of fans. Okay, I'm going using the soccer image again. Determination fueled his every step as he trained relentlessly, honing his skills under the scorching sun. With each goal he scored, he silenced the doubters and inspired the dreamers. Offers poured in from top clubs, and he sees the opportunity to shine on the world stage. The boy who once watched in awe as his idols played on TV had become a professional footballer, a symbol of perseverance and passion for the beautiful game. You are, grade 12s, that shy boy. You cannot think that this will come easily to you. Grade 12 particularly English home language, should not be easy. Okay, you've got to work at it. You must want to do well. It was never meant to be easy, and the examiners are not going to make it easy. If the examiners make it easy for everybody, they get criticized. Okay, training for your finals means practicing the skills that you know that they need, okay, or you need. Where do you find these? Look at past papers, study guides, Online, you, you're doing the right thing by being in this session this morning. Um, winter schools, last pushes, telematics, look at all of these things. And the nice thing about the um, e-portal is that it's zero rated, which means that you, it's no data to download those things from the e-portal. Okay. And if you were looking at telematics live, just by the way, guys, okay, um, you will have data or required data, but when you download the videos afterwards and they're all saved, okay? And and if your teachers don't know about telematics, ask them to find out. Um, when you download those videos and you go through the things that the, the presenters present, um, it is zero rated as well, okay? Which means that you don't use data, right? Practice, reflect, repeat. Practice, reflect, repeat. Look at the types of questions that come up time and time again. Look at gaps in your knowledge. Don't be too hard on yourself, but pick yourself up and try again. And remember, the more you prepare, the more you will do better. A goal might not win a game, okay, but you can't win a game without scoring a goal. Okay, so that is really, really important 
that the key to certainly paper one, practice, repeat, reflect. Right, I've asked them to give you, we've recommended down to a two minute break. Okay, I, I know it's, it's a long session, but please, if you wouldn't mind, um, just resetting yourself, okay, and then, um, and then we will go on to paper three, and I will move through that um, as quickly as possible. Right, grade 12. Sorry it wasn't longer. I'd love to have you guys sort of enjoy the, um, if it's sunny there by you. I mean, I know this is uh, District North, so all four seasons in one day. Some people might have rain, some people might have snow, and other people are able to catch a tan in this, in this uh, beautiful city that we call ours. Right, guys, so um, I want to start off now by, and I hope... I um, want to start off now by posing the question with regards to why Paper 3 is so important. Um, paper 3 really is, um, you know, we, we, we tend to put it to the side and we go, oh, well, you know, we, we're just going to write something and it's easy because we can do it. But um, along with being a Paper 1 marker for the last three exam sessions, and I'm talking last year, May, last year, no, November, and, and this year, I've been a Paper 3 marker as well. We've marked two papers at the in the matric finals. And um, we have the saying, or they have the saying in Paper 3, and, and really, guys, you need to understand that Paper 3 markers are some of the kindest people and i'm not just saying that i'm by heart i'm a paper one marker and i will be marking at the end of the year but they are some of the kindest most um loving people and they want you guys to succeed um but you've got to give them the details and the and the the substance to succeed so your school-based assessment everything that you've done this year and including your prelim exams will be uh, converted to a mark out of 100 out of 400 that's 25 percent of your final mark then you've completed your orals um and uh, you know sort of our two moms for the district auntie shireen and auntie michelle or whoever's helping them will come around and they will do district moderation or oral moderation and they 
and I know they're listening into this, but they are the most lovely people as well. Okay, um, they are there to just check that the marks that have been given are at the level that you are meant to um, have. Then you go into your matric final papers, and you've got three papers that you write. This year, believe it or not, you are writing paper three first. So you should be fresh as a daisy, not generally in the past, it used to be the last one and you just want to go on holiday and you want to finish school and you don't want to write this exam. And that's really, really important because if you have a look at it, paper one counts for 17 and a half percent. Paper two, which you uh, had a look at on, on, on Monday, counts for 20 percent. But your paper three counts the one paper at the end of the year counts exactly the same amount as your paper um, or all of your, all of the work that you've done throughout the year, 25%. So if you are uncertain of paper one and paper two, paper three is where you save yourself. Paper three is where you get the marks that you want to do the rest of the um, your life. And, and remember, guys, as I said, you've got three months, give it everything over here because the next three months, I always tell my learners, next three months is the, it will determine what your next 40 years are going to be like. Okay, so it's really, really important that we take paper three seriously and we do it as well as possible. Okay, right. I just want to quickly recap on process writing. Um, a lot of people, I, and I hate it with when this happens, when you read an essay in an exam and then the page after that, there's their planning because you think that, you know, you've got marks for planning. So I must I must include like this five word plan or that type of thing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, well, you know, I had a class in 2019. Um, my top student came fourth for English in the province. She came third in the country for everything else. So she was exceptionally, exceptionally um, intelligent. One of a one of a generation. But that whole class, there were there were five or six of them at least that pushed top, top, top marks. Um, and and it was the most it's it's one of those classes where you you are humbled to be able to teach. And I'm I'm hoping that every single teacher has one of those classes, but also that you are those kinds of learners that that the teacher feels humbled to serve you in terms of teaching. And the one thing that stuck out from those classes that I didn't have for many other classes that I've taught was when they used to write creatively, their planning was a full page. Okay, their planning was details and that type of thing. And you could see that there were arrows drawn from that concept to that con. They really thought through what they wanted to plan. So I want to tell you now, guys, that planning is not, it's not something that you think that you feel you need to do. It is essential for writing a good piece of, of writing. Okay, and I know that many people because we don't read a lot, we don't like to write a lot. And we only write when we have to, and it's for marks. Um, that's one of the questions that, e, you know, when you hear that, uh, sir, is this for marks? That that really, you know, sort of hurts my heart. You know, write so that you can, you know, put something of yourself down on paper. Right. Planning varies according to the type of piece that you want to write. So it should look differently if you want to write a story versus if you want to write an argument, or if you want to write a description, versus if you want to just discuss something. It should look differently. Okay, planning is essential. It's not an afterthought. It's not something we do afterwards because we think, hey, we get more marks for it. You don't. We mark the draft. Okay, we mark the, the, the final draft, whatever. If there's something we don't understand in the final draft, we go back to the rough draft, and we look at the planning. What was your thought processes going ahead? Okay. The more detailed the plan, the better the essay. Okay. And we know the old adage, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be quite open and honest with you. I think everybody can write better than they do. Okay. 
um, they just need to do it um, more. Okay, right. One of the also big frustrations for me in matric finals is to see people walking out of a three hour writing paper after two hours or after an hour and a half. Okay, don't do it. Use your time. Okay, give the best that you've got. Remember, this is the mark that's going to get you into that course of study that you want to study, or it's going to give you that matric exam, uh, exam um, that that what we used to call the matric exemption, the bachelor pass or whatever. This is the exam that's going to get you there. Right, the instructions, it consists of two sections, the paper, okay? You've got your essay to do in the first one, section A. That's a 50 marker, okay? And then you've got two transactional pieces, okay, each both worth 25 marks. One of the most frustrating things that we found in the past marking paper threes is people will do the essay and they will do one transactional piece. Please make sure that you've done both, okay? You've got to do 100 marks worth of writing for people to give you as much as possible, okay? Answer one question in section A, two questions in section B. Okay, don't think I've got to do an essay and transactional, you've got to do two transactionals. Right, write in the language that you are being assessed in, which is English, okay, and it's English home language, so we expect a certain level of, um, you know, sort of vocabulary and discussion. Okay, right. Um, in your reading time for this exam, look at the questions that jump out of you. Um, out of you, basically. So, so what, there are certain questions in any single paper that you're you're drawn to, and you can say something about that, because the important thing is that you've got something, and you've got something valuable to say. Right. Um, start each section a new page. Again, it creates a good impression with the marker. If your script is untidy, it might negatively affect the impression that you need to make. Okay, remember, um, markers are sitting there as your teachers do, and they sit and they mark for long hours. And if they are tired and if their eyes are tired, um, then sometimes it's going to be difficult for them to find that message that you want to want them to have. Okay, right. And then, as I said, planning is really, really important. Okay, look at the time allocation, try and stick to the time limit. You will know that if you are struggling to come up with something, okay, um, to write, write a neat first draft. So for instance, if you sit there and all of a sudden, all level of creativity has deserted you and I don't know, these topics are so hard and there's nothing much that I can identify with or whatever, Again, don't panic. Remember the building blocks. Break it down to simple building blocks, okay, and start small. But then if you feel that you're going to run out of time, if you're not going to get that essay, which ideally is planning, okay, do your planning well. Spend time on it. Don't just go, okay, two minutes, let me write so I can be out of here in time for seven to line or whatever, okay? Um, and I think, you know, sort of if you're out of there in time for seven to line, if you spend the whole three hours, you'll still make, um, oh, I've just remembered seven to line doesn't, it's been canceled. So I don't know if they're still um, showing it. Anyway, number the answers correctly according to the number system, okay? Don't just think because you've written an essay that, that they're going to figure out what you're writing about. And I'll show you why, because there's an expected answer for these essays, okay? And remember, this is like your CV. You want your uh, the examiners to have the best impression of you. Remember the different types of essays. We've got a story, a narrative, okay, which goes down well. But remember, a story is structured, okay. It has that 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 setting. It is that build up with that um, up to a climax. You've got the, the 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 tension that must occur. You've got a descriptive essay, okay, that central metaphor which you unpack for the 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 reader, you've got a discussion, okay, you're looking at a particular topic, and write about something that you know. If it if there's a topic there that you know nothing about, and you feel, hey, I can't really say something about it, don't answer that topic. This is why there's a choice, okay. Um, you've got an argumentative essay, and remember, 
an argument is structured like like you have been taught to write a literature essay it's about making your point providing evidence it, it's like that court case where you are opening an argument you're arguing different pieces of how this person should be guilty or not guilty or whatever and then you're summarizing why you feel that this is the side that the jury must determine remember the marker is the jury and then a reflective which is something from your own personal um, life experience that you can share with your reader okay right i just want to talk about the rubric and you'll find that if your teachers um, have said this to you, they've included a rubric, and I hope that you all have somewhere a pasted in copy of the rubrics that are required in English home language. There are um, four basic rubrics, two for the paper, two literature, okay, the poetry essay and the literature essay, and then you've got your essay, creative writing rubric and you've got your transactional rubric. You need to know what those are all, all about because that's the only way that you will see, okay, have I given a well-crafted response? Is it relevant and interesting? Is it well-organized, coherent, including introduction, body, and conclusion? Just a side note there, grade 12s, an introduction, body, and conclusion doesn't mean that your essay is three paragraphs long. Rather, your introduction is one paragraph, your body is three to five paragraphs, and your conclusion is a rounding up or a concluding paragraph. Okay, um, there's nothing worse than having this wall of words that come at you because people cannot leave a line. Remember, at the end of the year, um, the Department of the WCED gives you examination booklets. They have already been, um, you know, sort of, printed like that. So use the paper in there. If you feel you don't want to leave lines because you want to save paper, use the paper. Don't leave space at the end of the book, rather use it. So this acronym that I've come up with is ROPE. Okay. Your writing should be relevant and real. Okay. Nobody knows your life experience but you. And the examiner or the marker wants to get to know you. A lot of people think, hey, I must write the right answer or whatever. I can tell you now, guys, the most, the best answer is the most personal answer. It's where I might not know you from a bar of soap, but in reading your answer, I've gotten to know you a bit better because it's it's from the heart and and relevant and real or, as we would say, authentic. That is the best writing. That's something that I would look forward to. And that's what I love reading about, I love marking essays because it's it's like a conversation that I have with my learners and with, with other people. I get to know a bit more about them. And and remember, guys, that, that um, at the end of the year for your paper three, the markers don't know you, um, so you can share with them, you know, what's on your heart. You might feel, yeah, I don't want to share this because you know, my teacher knows me and might judge me or whatever. The markers don't do that. They don't know you. But be real with them. Be be relevant. Okay. Answer that question that they've been posed. Okay. Organized. Your essay should flow. It should be structured. It should go from point to point to point so that we can see if it's a story, your story should build up to that 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 key moment. And my recommendation for that grade 12s, is that when we have a story, don't include a storyline that spans weeks or months. If you're writing a book one day and you've got eight, 900 pages or 400 pages, you can do that. But remember, a 400 word essay, you don't have time. Okay, so we generally set um, as a writing exercise, we set in a an essay topic that we, we say you've got two minutes from the start of your essay to the end of your essay. Now write the essay. And so the whole essay should be the start of the essay, build it up to the end of the essay. Two minutes in real time should have overlapped. Okay, not that you take two minutes to write the essay, but rather that that the detail that you include in the essay is not is is a lot rather than this diluted 
essay that goes no ways. Please, please, please use paragraphs. Okay. Um, do you know what a paragraph does? It allows your brain to reset. Okay. And you, you focus on the point of the next paragraph. If you just write one paragraph, then we've got to, as markers, we've got to look for, okay, that's your point. Good point. That's your point. Good point. And eventually, you know, like me, I say I lose track halfway through the paragraph and I have to reread it and then make sure that it's easy to understand. Okay. Make sure that the message that you want to communicate to your reader is the right message. Remember, guys, the reader is important here. Don't think that I'm writing just because I need to write. The reader is exceptionally important. So write for them. What message, what uh, profound message, um, you know, that I have is something that I can share with them. Right. So um, that was, you should have a copy of this, the Section A essay. Um, you know, sort of I generally, if, if, if I had to think about answering this, I would break it down. And um, this is what I've shown you here is part of the marking guideline. Believe it or not, there is a marking guideline for paper three as well. And so they they highlight certain things and they say, well, you know, don't just accept a literal response. The person could be figurative as well, things like that. Um, so this is what you should be looking at. This was the rhythm of city life. OK, and rhythm, you can sit there, you can talk about music, you can talk about the tempo of life, you can talk about the pace or the time right from what you know. And the reader wants um, because remember, the reader wants to know you. So that's personal experience. That's the first point I would like to make. Then remember, in paragraphing, one idea and discussion per paragraph. Don't put five ideas into a paragraph because then it dilutes your ideas. Okay, remember the reader is important. You must break it down for them. Don't write what you know everybody else is going to write about. If your teacher sets you the same creative writing task. Oh, yeah. Are you all going to write the same essay? But just the names differ, you know, and chances are it happens because you've got all a similar life experience. So I always go, I always tell my learners, um, if I had to get you to write the story of your weekend, okay, you all went to the same, you know, sort of mall or you all hung out with one another or you might all have gone to the same party or you all played the same match or whatever, how's it going to be different? So I can't say that your writing is original or fresh or, you know, there, there are ideas there. You must look at it from a different perspective. Try and looking at it from, uh, you know, sort of a, a different idea. Okay, right. Then in terms of the language component of the rubric, remember there are three components to the creative writing rubric. There's the content, which is really, really important. And they've got a saying with the paper threes that content is king. Okay. They've got a uh, content is king. So if you've got good content, okay, you will get a good mark. Um, in terms of the language, if you have a look at a skillful over here, your tone, your register, your style, your vocabulary is appropriate. OK, it's effective. The language is effective and consistently appropriate and it's largely error free. OK, I don't know if you've ever got those essays back like I used to get back at school and it just looked like there was a red pen everywhere um, underlining all the mistakes that I'd made and that type of thing. Um, I need to start writing as correctly as possible. And if I'm making too many spelling mistakes, then I need to either fix my spelling or I not need to not use those words. No words that or use words that you know how to spell. OK, um, be descriptive. Use adjectives. OK, similes, metaphors, things that go to the five senses. And this is not just in a descriptive essay. This is in all your essays. Remember, as a reader, if you're telling me a story, I want to feel like I'm there. Um, when you write grade 12s, you should not be trying to, you know, write correctly and say, OK, this is the idea. You need to change my emotions. OK, I need to move on. Right. Please be formal. You're writing for the right audience. OK, so if it's a, di a discursive or um, argumentative, make sure that you um, 
you are using language that is appropriate and not slang writing okay um nothing irritates me more than you know sort of you just trying to discuss something really really important and use like this oak here and that you know cheeky over there and that type of thing it really you need to be more correct and more formal in your writing remember um, English teachers are special and we want to read something that is good for us. Okay, right. I did want to do a, a, a quick short lift, but I'm not going to do it now. But in terms of a creative thing, and you can do this afterwards, um, is you look at the person sitting next to you and you um, try and be descriptive about their nose or their eyes. Okay, and you can write a metaphor or a simile to describe their nose. But what the point that I'm wanting to make out of this, you know, um, if you, you might be very self-conscious about it at the moment, um, but, but you might come up with things like John's nose is like the Nile River, long and always running, okay? Or Sharon's nose is like the Kango Caves with thousands of tourists visiting each year, okay? Fudzi's nose is like a compass, always pointing to where the go gossip is. Or Elton's nose is like my wallet, empty. Um, those are images that you could use in your writing, not those particular ones, but think of interesting ways of saying something um, that could be said simpler. Okay. Um, or, you know, not just being literal all the time. This slide shows three different paragraphs, and it's an introduction to that first topic, the rhythm of city life, written in three ways. And I'm just wanting to quickly read through it. Okay. Imagine a city that never sleeps where cars zoom, people chat, and lights sparkle. The rhythm of city life explores how cities hum with activity from morning buzz to nighttime calm. Let's dive into how this exciting pace creates a unique melody that shapes city living every day. Then we ask it to be a bit more descriptive. Imagine a bustling city where the streets are alive with honking cars, chattering crowds, and glowing lights. The rhythm of city life explores how the city hums with energy, from the sunrise rush to the twinkling nightlife. Discover how this lively beat creates a vibrant and exciting place to live bit more descriptive. You can see the differences. One is literal. The one is a bit more figurative. The last one is a bit more formal. Okay. Imagine a vibrant cityscape where the ceaseless hum of traffic, the lively chatter of pedestrians, and the glow of streetlights create a symphony of activity. The rhythm of city life explores the dynamic pace of urban living, illustrating how the intricate patterns of daily life shape and energize the modern city. Any one of those in response as an opening paragraph is, um, is really something that will grab the reader, but you can see how you can change your language to be a bit more descriptive or just a bit more formal to create a very, very positive impression. Right. Just in terms of preparing for your prelims and your final exams. And you'll see this image over here that says practice. And it doesn't say makes perfect. We've crossed it up. Makes progress. Okay. You've got to practice writing. Look at past paper essay topics. Plan how you would answer some of these. And, and I'm glad that they've photocopied last year's um, paper for you. Have a look at those topics. And then come up with a mind map as to how you would answer them. Right. Set aside each time, um, set aside time to write at least one essay per week or set aside time to write one essay for every two weeks, okay? In the second week, revise or write the essay looking for better ways to say something. Um, if you've got a cell phone to highlight or to Google synonyms for words or phrases that you might have, is is valuable it's not it's not going i'm i'm looking for something else to write and and one of the biggest things now and let's deal with the ele elephant in the room you know so sort of chat gpt or or ai writing essays again it's not going to be authentic for you 
and it's not your own work and, and and you need to be able to stand behind it and say i've written this and this is part of me okay but it doesn't say that you can't find ways of saying what you want to say in a better way so practice your writing um you can't expect the first essay that you write to be the one that's for marks that's counterproductive okay right Remember those building blocks, break it down. Um, how do I plan? How do I, um, how do I write this effectively? Paragraph by paragraph. Take time to work on finishing an essay strong. Focus on those um, comprehensions and then get feedback from friends and teachers and learn from that free feedback. Okay, I don't have time to give you a two minute break. We're almost out of time, but I do want to just deal quickly with section B. Remember two, OK, do both transactional pieces and you have been given, I hope, the formats um, for some of those transactional pieces. OK, I just want to skip ahead to um, to some of the issues that we deal with it. OK, yeah. right. Um, the you should have the format for a formal letter and please excuse me if I go through this um, thing the the formal letter last year was writing a letter of complaint to a, uh, a, a councilman okay um, about abandoned buildings um, be specific because it gives your writing authenticity okay so where are these buildings situated what do they look like why are they perhaps abandoned okay where are they? What section of your community are they? And then unpack why they're becoming a major concern. So many essays or so many letters we, we read last year were about, oh, uh, we'd like to complain about these abandoned buildings. They are a concern in our community. Why are they a concern? Okay, what's happening in those buildings? Are you Don't you like them because they are unattractive and it's ruining the neighborhood? Or don't you like them because perhaps there might be people living in there that are engaged in criminal activities. Always answer in your, um, your, your transactional piece, the what, the where, the when, the why, the how. And what do you think the city councillor should do? Okay, so give suggestions in your, in your transactional piece. Um, don't just sit there saying, well, you know what to do, we're just writing this letter of complaint. Remember, any marker reading a transactional piece um, should believe in what you've written. Okay, the dialogue, okay, you have strong views on whether there is a place for traditions in modern uh, democracy, write the dialogue between you and someone with opposing views, okay. What traditions are you talking about? Why do you feel so strongly about them, okay? Um, why are they not demo democratic? So why why are there no is there no place for them, and then why doesn't the person that you're dealing with, okay, um, agree with you? With regards to dialogue, please remember the dialogue only involves two people, not three or four, okay. The tone must be as if it's those two people. So if it's two friends, the language must be as if it's the two friends talking, okay. Please remember the format, the block format for the dialogue, and please check your punctuation. Very often, meaning is lost because people aren't punctuating it correctly. Okay. Grade 12, my apologies for rushing that last bit over there. Um, there's a lot that you can use, but, but my recommendation to you is start now and start practicing these pieces of writing as you go along. You can't you can't expect the next time that you're going to have it is in prelims and then you'll repeatedly get in, in, in finals. If you don't write regularly, it's something that is starkly apparent at the end of the year. Mrs. Rhoda, that's uh, my time. I'm going to um, hand back to you. Thank you very much.